thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak at RSE Con. I've, I've really enjoyed it. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the Jazzily title talk from microscope to metadata. Now, I'm sure all of you in the room have experience of trying to get people to care about data. I am going to try and persuade you to care about metadata. So this is this is the uh, the point of the talk. So I'm Laura Schemelt. I'm the head of the research um, software engineering team at the Rosalind Franklin Institute. Um, and this is us. This is our, our fancy building. Uh, we are a fairly new institute. We were established in um, 2017, I want to say, and the building was completed in um, uh, early 2021. Um, we are a national institute for biotechnology. Um, and uh, what we do is we try to investigate disease mechanism over the sort of entire, I'm going to use a software engineering a term here, but the entire what I call biological paradigm. I'm sure there's a lot of biologists who are spinning in their chairs right now going, what on earth is this? But what we mean here is you have biology on a molecular scale, biology on a cellular scale, then to tissue, then to organ, and then to full body. And actually, biology is really hard. It's a really hard science. And so those communities, it's people work on just cells or just tissue or just full body. And the considerations are different. So one of the things that we're trying to do in the Franklin is disrupt this by trying to bring everyone together. Now, this slide wasn't meant to be comical, but um, if you were present at the conference last night, uh, I have a Venn diagram. It is a full Venn diagram. It is not an Euler diagram. And this is what how we plan to break, uh, do this disruption in this uh, biological paradigm, as I've so called it. So <clears throat> we're going to image uh, with our microscopes and our mass spectrometry. We're going to intervene, and this is this is magic to me. Um, when people go and alter DNA strands and do their fancy chemistry to change uh, how uh, life uh, goes, and then this is where we come in and why I have a job. We're going to interpret using machine learning. Yeah, let's do that. Um, but what I think this Venn diagram, and inside this Venn diagram is the Rosalind Franklin logo. Um, so this is brings us all together to do these things. But what I think is actually missing from this diagram is data. Right? Data underpins all of this diagram. But what's especially missing from this diagram is metadata. The context of your data actually links how you get between these circles. Right, knowing where you imaged something and who imaged it and what sample it was on and how many different places a sample's been measured. So what you want to do is use your metadata to create a knowledge graph. It's very powerful in that respect, but it's also power, uh, powerful when we start to talk about other parts of providing this metadata. So it's very powerful uh, in cybersecurity. It's very powerful when you're talking about access management. And it's extremely powerful when we talk about FAIR. Um, so we have all this stuff. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we kind of built, trying to build up this, this metadata catalog and the, the infrastructure we have. So um, as you can see, I have one picture of a microscope. So uh, on the far left there, you can see uh, our fanciest microscope that you have to access using a ladder, which is very high tech. Uh, and um, one of the most important things about our instruments at the Franklin is actually we have no instrument development capability within the Institute. So we actually partner with industrial um, industry and other universities to provide this instrumentation. And what we bring is how we use that instrumentation. So we actually have no access to control software or control systems, which when you're building data acquisition and data management tools, this is normally where you start, especially if you want to capture scientific metadata. But we have no access to that. And if we wanted to, I'm sure we would void a lot of expensive maintenance contracts, which nobody wants to do. So how, uh, and so this is also an, another interesting thing about the Franklin, this is our take in a year. So when I sat down to write this presentation at the end of August, I had a look at how much data we've taken in the year and we're around sort of like 450 terabytes. So um, this is, I'm not going to play the my data's bigger than yours contest because 
people from Diamond will look at this and go, this is nothing. But this is certainly non-trivial, right? 450 terabytes, it's a lot of data, right? Um, and so it, it, you need a lot of management to, um, to work with this and to shuff, shovel this around your organization and move it from the place where you interrogate it uh, sorry, from the place where you measure it to the place where you interrogate it, to the place where you, you store it. And you've also got to do this for cheap as well. Um, so one thing, and we also want to do this in the context of FAIR. We, are, we want to give back our science to the public. We want to make our data sets available so um, everyone can do really exciting projects on them. Um, and we all, love a, we all love a good open source data set, and there's a lot of value to be had in them. However, I wanted to just talk about FAIR as there's a very low bar to FAIR. So we have a study here that was done at the, uh, the Journal of uh, Clinical uh, Epidemiology, and it was published uh, last year in May. And basically what they were saying in this study was, Lots of people, especially in biological sciences now, if you want to publish in higher impact journals, you need to publish your data set. And the way you do this is go, if you would like your data, please email me. So they uh, went around and emailed all the people who said, if you'd like my data, please email me. And they only got about 10% of it back. <laughs> so all this sort of fair compliance, we can do better. And as RSCs, we can actually bring the tools and the capability to do this better for researchers. So we don't just have to bung an email address on the paper and hope it gets published. So with all that in mind, how do we do this at the Rosalind Franklin Institute? And so this is a very, very basic architecture and I'm gonna sort of drill down into it. So one, we can't access the control system of an instrument, but we are really lucky in one respect all instruments at some point, they have to write their data to a file system. And this is true. We don't work in any IoT with fast cache and straight into the cloud. We write with detectors that the speed is necessary to have a massive SSD next to it and write to it. And this is really good for us because it means that we have something general which we can start with, which is the fact that when a file is written to disk, we can then transfer it. So then we sort of transfer it up into our cloud um, and I'll go through what that cloud is and, and what it does. And uh, then we uh, have this metadata catalog called SciCat. And so in the cloud, we process our metadata and we pass it to our metadata catalog SciCat. The other route, which is an and route, not an or route, is uh, we partner with Baskerville, some people who are here from Baskerville in this conference. Uh, so we, we have access to high performance computing for our data analysis, not just high performance computing in the cloud. Um, and so we can transfer direct from instruments and also now from our cloud storage uh, to Baskerville, do our processing again, mint the metadata of the processing and, and to put it into SciCat. So what the hell is SciCat? SciCat is a, uh, it stands for um, scientific uh, catalog. Uh, it's not anything related to SciKit. In fact, it's on a, a TypeScript back at, um, TypeScript platform. So uh, it's got nothing to do with the sort of SciKit uh, Python infrastructure. And, and this is an example of a metadata catalog. It was developed by the European Spallation Source and the Paul Sherrett Institute to provide a, a common catalog for neutron and photon sources. So these are user facilities. And generally what happens is researchers go, they do their um, work at a user facility, they take their data, they go away, and then they might go to another user facility. And so by having a common platform and a common metadata across all facilities, you would hope that users can then have a place where they can take their metadata from ESS or PSI or Diamond Light Source or wherever users like at. And um, a good, it's a good point now to pause and say, what's metadata? Because actually I didn't really explain that very well and not everyone knows. So metadata is kind of the asset around the data. So you have your basic or what we call transactional metadata of who took it, where it was taken, what time it was taken. And then we have other things that uh, we can do to enrich it. So this is the scientific metadata, which you can kind of see at the bottom there. It's a bit small, but these uh, in this example, there is a sort of grid position and a tilt angle and the voltage you used uh, from your instrument. 
And then in the SciCat uh, catalog, which is a document store in the back end, it's got quite a free schema. So you can link it to samples and instruments and things like that. And it's my great wish that in the Franklin, we get to the stage where PIs do not need access to our compute infrastructure, that they can sit down with their direct report and discuss the data and just use the metadata and the images that we show here in SciCat. They don't have to worry about the processing. We're not there yet, that's, that's the wish. So who are we? Um, so we're a really small team. Uh, so there's me and there's two senior RSEs and three RSEs, and we are a real jack of all trades. So we do both infrastructure work and we do software development. So we, we're not privileged enough to have RFIDs and RSEs. We are, we're an RFID SE. Um, the other cool thing about us is actually we have no on-prem compute. We have no servers, we have no hardware. And so we have external partners of STEFC and AWS, and I should have mentioned Baskerville. I apologize, I didn't mention it. STFSC provide most of the workhorse of our compute uh, because they are cheaper than AWS, but I must say they really provide a good service and we really enjoy working with our collaborators at STFC. The other thing that we have is we work with an open source where possible, licensed where applicable uh, kind of model. So. I would like to say that paying for stuff is not a dirty word. If you've got a logging system that costs you $15 a month, just use it instead of getting your RSE to set up Loki. Like if you, if you, I'm, I'm not talking about, yeah, let's put everything in AWS and pay our um, public cloud provider for all the services, but there are lots of stuff out there. Um, you know, front end UI components and things that you can buy quite cheaply and save you a lot of time. We are absolutely dedicated to open source. Everything we do, we try to make as open source as possible, but closed source, I think has its place in an infrastructure. So this is us. You can't come to an RSC con without an architecture diagram. And I'm really proud of this. This is something that the team have worked towards in the um, last few years. And there's a lot of tech uh, and it's been super fun to work on this. Um, but this is roughly the, um, the sort of things that we, we've been doing. Um, and uh, on the panel this morning, um, Arthur mentioned the idea of moving towards cloud to give uh, data scientists more freedom to do work within a trusted environment. This is kind of what we've got here. Uh, so we have um, an instrument PC. We use Globus to do our transfer. It transfers the data up to a Globus server, and then it goes into uh, Echo, which is our campaign store. So. All our storage is provided by Ceph. Ceph is an open source file system software. Um, the cluster itself is managed by STFC and is a tier one facility for CERN. So it's fun to piggyback off their data. Um, our data is like tiny compared to what they produce. Um, Echo is our campaign store. And then we also run uh, faster file storage uh, on Ceph FS. Um, and this backs our virtual machine offering. So we spin up loads of virtual machines in the OpenStack cloud, again, managed by SDSC. And these virtual machines um, are quite bespoke. So they can often have high power GPU. They can often have lots of CPU. So, you know, as a researcher, if you've got a powerful piece of software like RelyOn or CraftSpark that requires a really heavy architecture, you don't have to spend 15 grand of your research budget on a machine that sits onto your desk. We will manage that all for you. We do all the management and access control via an RDP gateway uh, called Guacamole. Uh, it's an Apache project. Highly recommend if you've got this sort of problem to use Guacamole. And then the pièce de résistance. My new love, Kubernetes, is brilliant. Um, so we have our metadata catalog as a service running on Kubernetes. And we're also investigating Airflow. I've seen the logo around on a few bits and pieces to run function as a service. And here we want to go for an um, event-driven architecture where as soon as a piece of data is hitting this bucket, we trigger a, a function to create the metadata in a metadata API, and then we send it to SciCat. And then this can be extended to any other um, data as a service, micro um, services that you want. Oh, and on top of this, we have uh, Grafana and Prometheus doing all our logging. Auto monitoring is really, really important if you're in, in small teams, and I would highly recommend setting it up. The future, again, as of last night's speaker, he also mentioned Dot Brown. I'm going to mention Dot Brown. 
where do we want to go? I stole this slide from a colleague, Alex, because I really, really like it. It is enough pop culture slash architecture for this kind of conference. Um, but what we would love to do is leverage the power of Kubernetes. So on the left, we have a config map in Kubernetes. And this is an instrument. And when we have a new instrument or we want to make changes to an instrument, all we do is edit our config map. We pass it to an API server. We can set up our SciCat controller to create all the metadata. We set up our storage controller to assign quotas, to um, create transfers and globus. And then we have our authentication controller to say who can access this data. And actually, authentication is the hardest part, but it's a, a, probably a whole talk on its own. So what's the impact been on the Franklin? Uh, so at the moment, we handle up to about 20 terabytes a day between Diamond and RM and the Franklin to just give you an, an idea of how um, of how much data we have, uh, we're doing just between two institutes. We're actually doing far more internal transfers and about a similar amount of transfer a week to Baskerville, something like 20 terabytes a week to Baskerville and back. We managed the data backup and transfer from about 40 odd instruments in the Franklin and that's growing. We have about 300,000 metadata items in our metadata catalog, and we have sort of 12 live maintained services for users, uh, including uh, uh, access management control and um, other fun stuff, monitoring. And we have about 20 plus user accessible VMs. So uh, running a wide range of software for analysis. Um, one thing I'd be really interested to hear from this community is the Franklin is 120 people. And by phase two, it should be about 200. So compared to university, we are a very small institute. So I would love to know how this scales. I really believe that this scales in terms of the amount of data. Right? This, could, this could work for several petabytes. But I don't know how this would work in an institute of about you know, tens of thousands of people, because actually access management and who owns the data is a really difficult part of how this is all constructed and how to do this in an automated way. So I will answer my question, which is how fair is fair? Actually, within the Rosalind Franklin Institute, we are okay. We, our data is accessible. It's becoming more and more findable with SciCat. There are lots of problems with that, but we have a method that we, we're gonna try to make our data more findable. Interoperable, and reproducible is a different story. And this is where we have our dialogue with the users because we cannot tell them what ontology they need to use for their data, whether their science is reproducible, how their data is going to come off their instruments, um, but we can help them uh, move towards standardized naming conventions, educate them on data lifecycle and educate them on how a data asset um, is is curated and, and how important metadata is. So I'd really love to hear your thoughts on how you think this would scale in a in a bigger a bigger organization. So with that, I'd like to really I'd like to thank my team. Uh, so Mark Bashan's the head of team, um, Alex uh, and Sylvie are uh, at senior RSEs, and then uh, we have a few more members. I'd really like to invite, uh, to thank uh, partners at STFC. And also I'd really like to um, thank the IT team. So at Franklin, we have a very small IT team who deal with enterprise IT and have really helped us out working with the instrument PCs. Um, and then thank, finally, would like to thank the Franklin science team. We're nowhere without our friendly users. Um, as you can imagine, we get some pushback with this, but there are lots of people who really want this and want to, um, it developed their science. And so um, we really thank them for their time and their testing. Thank you. So uh, top question here. I really like this one, was wondering it myself. So in order to do all this cool stuff with metadata, it is indeed cool stuff, um, it has to exist. How much of your data arrives with good meta metadata? How do you validate it? And how do you deal with missing metadata? Great question. Um, none of our data arrives with good metadata. First of all, we're trying to do some cool stuff and actually it all hangs in uh, access control. This, this is the biggest thing. So where we want to get to is actually plugging this into our grant management system. 
and codifying everything. And this will sort out our transactional metadata. So what we would ask users to do is make sure that they, somewhere in a transfer config there is, or a folder name, or even in a file itself, there is a project code. And using this project code, then we can reach out to our data access management systems and see who is a, who who is the data owner, who's the PI of that project, and who can can look at it. SciCat also adds, uh, adds a wonderful mechanism where it considers owner groups and access groups. So you can have an owner group, which is like the PI coi who does it, and then you can actually add your collaborators to access groups to see the metadata. Um, we actually have to write a lot of the metadata from scratch or the metadata parsing from scratch because our uh, we can't access the machine control. So normally you would take that from the machine control and you would uh, automatically send it to your metadata catalog when a scan starts or something. So actually we have to reverse engineer this. Some uh, And we can only do this when the file format is open source. Um, so actually for instruments where the file format is closed source, we, we don't have any metadata. So we're asking users to validate it, uh, to, to add it. Um, how do we deal with mess missing metadata? So at the moment, uh, we only consider transactional metadata as the most important stuff. Uh, we'll start from the low level. And if we're missing transactional metadata, actually we cannot put it into our infrastructure. So we haven't really worked this out yet. Uh, so often users just put it into USB and then take it off. Uh, but we we want to sort of have maybe like a staging area. So when our, my, our function as a service can't find the metadata, it pulls that that set of data tells us where, what machine it was from and what time it was created, uh, which we can get from the file and the, and the transfer location. And then we can maybe do like email lists and say, right, if you don't give us this or say this correctly, you're not gonna be able to access it. So stick and carrot. Great, thanks. So moving on to the next one. Uh, what's your experience of getting scientists to follow the schema, I guess? So I am being recorded. <laughs> Uh, most of the what we get is what is a schema. Um, but what's what's been really nice for us is actually we're in a community who have a really hard job to do. Biological science is really hard, but also in biological science, the data volume has massively increased in the last five, 10 years. And so for a lot of people, when they're doing their scientific training, they're working with Excel and that's totally fine. They can do all their science to a point where somebody said to me the other day, oh, but 15 terabytes is not a lot of data. Why is it taking me half a day to transfer 40 terabytes? Um, so, but we've had some, we've had some dialogue and this is kind of what's really, um, really useful. So we've actually taken a lot of the automation ourselves and so they don't actually have access to the schema so they have to choose how we they, 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 don't, they don't have a choice we just put it in um but we've also seen some really good practice being adopted so for example our chemistry theme have now got a fully standardized file naming system across all their instruments so if you walk to any instrument in the chemistry lab you're expected to, to save your file in a, a format which for a group of people who this was just completely unheard of, they're now talking about ontology, they're now talking about more interoperability. So yeah, it's an ongoing dialogue um, and I think it will never end. Yeah, certainly. And I think we'll try and get one more quickly in here if possible. Uh, so the top one here is, did you evaluate evaluate Umero uh, compared to SciCat for catalog cataloging the microscope data and metadata? I don't know what Omero is. That's um, fair. <laughs> but there's a lot of metadata catalogs out there. Um, uh, so the reason we used, if Omero is specifically from microscopes, one of the reasons we use SciCat is more general. So we actually don't just have microscopes. I use microscope because it was nice alliteration with metadata, but we have uh, we have a lot of different data sources. And actually there's something I didn't mention. In our 450 terabytes of data, we actually have two ends of the spectrum. So we have data that is many terabytes in size in a single data set. And then we have data which is a few kilobytes, 
but there are millions of files. And so actually the reason we chose SciCat was because of its uh, NoSQL backend. So we had a very free metadata structure or scientific metadata structure that would you know, be flexible for all these groups. But I don't know whether Amero does that. Great, yeah, fair, very fair. Uh, thank you very much. And please join me in thanking our speaker again. Cheers. <laughs>